Um, and we have been in the Hope series, and um, we're going to continue looking at hope and uh, an area this morning. And I had planned this talk uh, weeks and weeks and weeks ago, and I love the way how God sets this up, because it's almost like part B of last week. And uh, we're going to be looking at hope in his love, hope in his love. Now, just as way of recap in the Hope series, you can catch up online on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've looked at, as an anchor text, Romans 12, 12, that says, rejoice in hope. Paul's saying to the church in Rome, listen, hope is something you should rejoice in and be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer. Three uh, instructions uh, and exhortations that Paul gave the church that is still valid for today, by the way. And for me, I'm, I'm just meditating and praying through and trying to live this out this year. I really feel a focus to do these three things this year. And uh, we've been looking at what biblical hope is because biblical hope is not the kind of worldly hope, which is more like a wish, you know. I hope it doesn't rain this afternoon. It's, unlo- you know, I mean, how many times have we said that? I am so fed up with this. Anyone else fed up with the rain? Rain, rain, go away, come back another day, all that stuff, yeah. But you see, biblical hope is a confident expectation. It's not a wishful thinking. And I gave you a definition that I tried to come up with many weeks ago when we started this, which is this, that hope is a future, invisible, and confident expectation of the fulfillment of the promises of God. You see, our hope is based on the character of God and the promises that he gives us. And therefore, we can have hope because it is steadfast in him and his promises. And so what we've been doing is looking over what hope is, uh, the benefits of hope, how we can walk in hope, and then hope in different areas. But I think what we need to understand that there is an element that the Christian hope ultimately rests on the truth that God loves us. Think about it. Hope, Christian hope, not wishful thinking, but a confident expectation rests on the truth that God loves loves us, that God loves us. You know, his promises that he gives us are given out of that place of love for us. It's not that God decides to love us in a moment. It's that God is love. We're understanding this. God is love. It's not like he has a decision to make. Should I operate out of love for this person or not? No, everything that comes from God is love because he is love. And his steadfastness, our ability to put our faith and our hope and our trust in, comes out of the fact and the truth that he is unchanging and his love towards us is unchanging. And so, in a very real sense, friends, his love fuels our hope in him and the promises towards us. His love fuels our hope in him and the promises towards us. I want to look at Romans 5.5 5 very briefly. And Paul says this, and hope, this is biblical hope, hope in God, in his promises towards us. Hope does not put us to shame. It, when you say, I'm going to put my hope in God, it does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That love is a guarantee that we can put our hope in the promises of God. Do you see that? You see, you can't talk about hope and not talk about the love of God towards us. You cannot talk about God's love and not talk about the fact that we can have a confident expectation in him and his promises towards us. And so, I want to look at this morning a very beautiful psalm, Psalm 147. And I would like to read this to us. And I want to, from there, look at what the psalmist is saying to us today. Turn with me, if you will, if you have your Bible or a device, Psalm 147. It'll be on the screen as well in the room. And if you're online, it will be on your device. And it starts with this, praise the Lord. What a great way to start. I think we should all start our day like that, by the way. I try and make it a habit of the first things I pray when I open my eyes is thank you, Lord, and I praise him. It's a great way to start. That praise word here is uh, the Hebrew word hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Listen, it is fitting that we would praise God. In other words, he is due our praise. It is a fitting thing to do. It is a right thing to do. We praise God not because of how we feel, but because of who he is. That is what praise is. Praise is not dependent on your emotional state. Praise is a fitting thing to do to the God of the universe who created you and knitted you together in your mother's womb. That's why the psalmist often says, oh my soul, Will you praise the Lord? Sometimes we need to say to ourselves, let's praise God in spite of how I feel. Let's offer him a sacrifice of praise because it is fitting to do so because he is God. Are you with me? That's verse one. Wow, we're gonna be in for a long time, aren't we? This is good. We've only got 20 verses. Keep with me. The Lord, this is Jehovah, builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. What a God. He's not looking in the in crowd. He's looking for every crowd. He's looking for everyone, whether in or out. I mean, you see that in the nativity story. Where do the the angels go? They go to the outside where the shepherds are. I love that. The Lord builds up Jerusalem and gathers the outcasts. Maybe you feel like an outcast this morning. There's no such thing in God's economy. In God's kingdom, there's no such thing as an outcast. He heals the brokenhearted. He Binds up their wounds. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, my heart could do with some healing this morning. You're in the right place. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. This is amazing. I mean, there are trillions and trillions and trillions of stars. Did you know that? And he names each one. (whistles) Great is our Lord. I mean, isn't this interesting? As the psalmist writes this, he starts writing out what God does and then he just has to pause and say, wow, great is our Lord. I can't carry on without starting to praise him. I mean, that should be our life, should it not? As we reflect on his love and his goodness, go, man, I've just got to praise you, God. My mind is blown. Wow, you named all the stars. Praise you, God. I I struggle to name my three children. It took a very long time. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. Abundant. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord. Here we go. The psalmist can't carry on anymore. He's like, I've got to sing praise again. Let's just sing to the Lord. Anybody want to sing to the Lord? Good. We're going to in a moment. Now you see why we're doing the worship afterwards. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. God is a musician and he loves musicians. And our voice is an instrument as well. We love having these bands with lots of instruments because it's a way we can express our song worship to him. I love it. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. This is not a God that set the world in motion, kicked it into touch and then went and had a cup of tea. This is a God that's intimately involved in every aspect of our life. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not, listen, his delight, God's delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. He's not interested or impressed by how strong you are. He's not impressed with how, quote, successful you've been. He's not impressed with those things. That's not to say you shouldn't work out and be fit. Hear my heart. People over there laughing. But did you know that the Lord takes pleasure in things? Did you know that? Did you know that? Do you want to know what God takes pleasure in? You ready? It's on the screen. Thank you. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. Now, this is not a terror thing. This is not like when you go to a horror, please don't go to horror, watch more horror movies. Be smart. The Lord takes pleasure in those who have an awe, like who have God in a reverence, in awe, in like, 
wow, he's God. I don't want to sin because he is a holy God. I, I preached uh, last year on the fear of the Lord. That was one of my most favorite, I mean, it's not that I have a favorite sermon, but I really enjoyed preaching that, although I was trembling as I did. But we have lost that sense in our modern lives about the fear of the Lord, for fear of thinking that it's about being scared of God. It's not. It's about having an awe of God. And you know, sometimes we sin not because we don't realize he loves us, it's because we lost the fear of the Lord. And he takes pleasure in those that fear him, who say, wow, you are God. But guess what else he takes pleasure in? Those who hope in his steadfast love. <laughs> Isn't this interesting? Hope and love, hope, um, fear and love. It's interesting because I came across Psalm 33, 18. It says, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. How interesting is that, right? I mean, almost word for word. You know, often we, you know, oh, well, God is a God of love. He doesn't mind what you do. Therefore, this and that is okay. I don't read that in my Bible. I read that we need a healthy fear and awe and hold God rightly at the same time of knowing and walking in and putting hope in his love for us. They seem to come as a package, don't they? Lord, help us to know what that means and how we walk in that. And then, the psalmist is, is at that moment again. He's like, well, I just can't carry on anymore. I've got to praise God. Praise the Lord, oh Jerusalem. He's like, come on, people. It's like me. Praise the Lord. Hey, Verso Vineyard Church. Hey, preach it. Thank you. Praise you, oh God. Praise your God, oh Zion. Hey, Verso Vineyard Church, praise your God. I mean, what are we here for? Are we here for good coffee? Eh, don't answer that. We are, yeah. Are we here for good donuts? Yeah. But is that the focus? No. Because without uh, offending our amazing baristas, you can get good coffee other places. Sorry. Oops, my bad. And Krispy Kreme is in St. Albans, I think. I don't have Krispy Kremes. The point I'm trying to make is those are all good things, but that's not the main thing, is it? I mean, come on, Verso Vineyard Church. Praise God. For he, amen. Wow, come on. For he strengthens the bars of the gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He, what does that mean? God's provision. He sends out his command to the earth and word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his God, this cold? This is a, an amazing God. Lest we be flippant with the God of the universe, do we know who we're praising? Should we not tremble in our knees and say, wow, God. He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. You are a peculiar people. I'm not being rude, it's in the Bible. You are a royal priesthood. You are a co-heir, a son and daughter with, with Jesus Christ. Did you know that you get to rule and reign with him? Oh, Mark, steady, old chap. It's true. His promises towards you are yes and amen. So praise the Lord. What a love. I really want to experience more of that love, do you? Because that love is the kind of love that changes the world, it changes my life, the family around me. Listen, this kind of love, what do we hope for in this love? That he will save us from ourselves, from eternity without him, from hell, to put it blankly, blankly, bluntly, thank you. That he will never leave us nor forsake us, that he will defend us, that he will comfort us, that he will fulfill the promises he has given towards us. 
What kind of love is this? John 15, 13 says this, greater love has no one than this. Somebody lay down his life for his friends. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna be celebrating the most monumental, mind-blowing moment in history when Jesus, the Son of God, was nailed to that cross. And he paid for your sin and for mine. He took the punishment that was due you and due me. And in that divine moment, that divine exchange, his righteousness was given unto us. That when we, that we can run into the presence of a holy God. Why? Because God says, you're holy in my sight. What kind of love is that? That's, that's amazing love. And not only that, good news, he rose again. And we get to celebrate that on Easter Sunday. That death could not hold him. And did you know that nothing can separate you, as the scripture says, from the love of God? No height, no depth, no principality, no power, not even time itself. That's amazing. You see, his love is truly unfailing. It never fails, never runs out. There's a song, isn't there, about that? I, as I was looking at the subject of love this week, I came across a sermon by St. Andrew of Crete. He's an 8th century bishop. And his love, he said this, his love for man, this is God's love for man, will never rest until he has raised our earth-bound nature from glory to glory and made it one with his own in heaven. I love that. So I read it again. His love for man will never rest until he has raised our earth-bound nature from glory to glory and made it one with his own in heaven. God will never rest I want to read to you 1 Corinthians 13, 7. This is from the Amplified Version. Listen to these words. It's not on the screen. Love, God's love, its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances. And it endures everything without weakening. That's God's love. God's love is fadeless under all circumstances. And it endures everything. But here's the question I want to ask you before we move on in a moment to some worship. What stops us? What holds us back from experiencing his love? I'm reminded uh, this morning, as I was thinking about uh, this morning, of John Wesley. Many will know John Wesley, the founder of uh, Methodism, of the Methodist Church, a great revivalist. Um, his conversion story is that uh, he was in a Bible study group and the leader of the Bible study was reading the introduction to the book of Romans by um, the commentary that Martin Luther had written. And in that moment, as he heard the introduction, the Holy Spirit all of a sudden came upon him and he says in his diary, all of a sudden I experienced the love of God shed abroad in my heart. The love of God shed abroad in my heart. I love that phrase. I want to feel that. I want to know that. But you see, here's the thing. It's not like sometimes God's love is available and sometimes God's love isn't. It's that sometimes we're there and sometimes we're not. We seek love, don't we, in our lives. We seek love and solace from all manner of things, don't we? Some things are healthy. You know, we have godly relationships that God gives us in, in the covenant of marriage where we experience a particular kind of love. We have love outside of that, very special love with friendships, with kinships, with, with brothers and sisters, with family. These are healthy, God-given relationships that we have love for one another. But equally, we know we seek it in ways that are not right. Outside of those covenantal type of relationships, in ways in which the, we might want to self-medicate to get a sense of solace or comfort. Or maybe, maybe, maybe there's something else going on. We have fear that God will reject us. You know, um, I was recalling um, when Steph and I met. We met over 20 years ago now. We, we're going to be celebrating 20 years in November, aren't we, of marriage? Yeah. Looking forward to seeing what you're going to organize for us to celebrate. Thank you. No, I'm joking. I've done the past 19 years worth, so no, I'm joking. And um, it was one of those moments I met Steph at our church at the time. We were going in North Finchley at St. Barnabas in North Finchley, charismatic C of E church, the wonderful John Nan Coles 
were leading that church at the time. And Steph and I met there, and I, and I had been waiting uh, for, for a wife for a while, or at least for a partner at that point, a girlfriend. Um, and Steph came along, and I was pretty much, uh, wow, you know. And um, <laughs> I asked Steph out after maybe about a couple of weeks of meeting her. I'm a bit like that. And then I remember thinking, I really love her. I think I'm going to tell her I love her. I'm like, but Mark, it's only a week. <laughs> I don't care, I love her, but man, everyone's telling me, listen, go, go slow. Like, you don't, want to, you don't want to scare her off, Mark. You tell her you love her and she'll probably run. Clearly. <laughs> Thank you for confirming that you didn't run away. Yeah. But sometimes I think we're a bit like that with God. Oh, if I, if I, I want to tell him I love him, but what, what if? What if he's not there for me? And, and the story goes that I did tell her. And thankfully, she said the same, I love you. And then we got engaged after a few weeks and got married after eight months. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> I wasn't going to wait around. I didn't want someone else to snatch this lovely lady up. So uh, <laughs> I know a good thing when I see it. Um, thank you. But then as you get married and you're married, you have a fit, I hope they still love me. What if they fall out of love with me? What if it changes? What if, you know, you come out of the honeymoon? And I think we sometimes feel that with God, although we don't maybe articulate it in that manner. But I want to tell you, God will never reject you. As you seek him and you say, Lord, I want to experience your love. Would you minister to me? He's not going to say, nah, not interested. And if you've been saved for a long time, he's not going to wake up one day and go, you know what? I've been thinking, this isn't really working, this thing between you and I, you know? Just the way you don't put the lid on the toothpaste, it's just not working. You know, the way you leave the toilet seat up and... I, I, actually, I'm pretty good with that, to be fair. You know, and the toilet roll, you know, the paper needs to go over the top, not underneath. Thank you. And I'll just say, for the record, if you're underneath, you've got it wrong. Oh, thank you. Just saying... <clears throat> Man, my inbox is going to be full tomorrow morning. <laughs> but God doesn't do that. He loves us. He does. He loves us all. And my heart for this morning, and I believe this is a reflection of what God wants to do with us, is that we would experience his love this morning. That we would be able to put our hope in his love and that we would be able to turn that into worship. You know, the evidence of his love fuels us to worship him with all our hearts. Did you know that? I'd like to invite the band up. <clears throat>